There is no mystery about meditation. Everybody meditates. But this does not necessarily mean that everyone meditates constructively, harmoniously, or peacefully. For example, if you find yourself lost in the memory of an old hurt or old or peeves or grudges of any kind, or if you're thinking of the losses you had in the stock market in 1929, the blowout on the lonely road, how you sold apples on the street, it's a first-class meditation, but it's very negative and has very negative results. If you meditate <clears throat> on an old lawsuit, how you lost uh, everything, and the other one won through lies and deceit and trickery, and you're dwelling upon that, you have a first-class meditation. Your technique is very good, too, but you have very negative results because whatever you give attention to, your subconscious magnifies and multiplies exceedingly. In creative transcendental meditation, the past is dead. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. This one thing I do, Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind, reaching forth to the things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize. Prize of what? For health, happiness, peace, joy, vitality, and enthusiasm. So turn enthusiastically to that which is noble and godlike. When you find yourself listening to the TV at night or radio with the predictions of gloom and doom and hunger and all the rest of it, you're meditating because you're in a passive psychic receptive state. And the announcer is talking to you, you're the newscaster. And do you want to be hypnotized with all sorts of uh, negative suggestions of every kind? No, you have to reject these and you have to think of the opposite and say, I don't accept that. Why not read a psalm before you go to sleep at night? Like the 91st, the 23rd, 27th psalm, or the first psalm. Magnificent truths, eternal verities. And you are charging your subconscious mind with spiritual truths as you go into the deep of sleep. If you discover yourself as you drive along the road, quarreling mentally with the boss or somebody in the office, and you're... Uh, Angry, resentful, or hostile, you're indulging in a first-class meditation with very poor results. You see, meditation means the inner conversation you have inside yourself. What do you say to yourself when you're all alone? That inner speech is always made manifest. Uspensky called it, inner speech, he said, was solidified sound. Because that's what you really believe that inner talk you have with yourself. A wonderful sense of inner peace should fill your soul when you meditate, when you pray. Emerson said that meditation was the contemplation of the truths of God from the highest standpoint. For example, on Sunday morning, when all the audience gets quiet, and we dwell upon a certain great truth of God, for example, God is love, or his peace fills my soul. Our God is guiding me now. The light of God illumines my pathway. When you meditate on these a simple truths, in the quietude of your own mind, wonders will begin to happen as you pray, as you sustain that presence. It's a wonderful form of prayer, quieting the mind. Remember, if you have a vessel and there's, it's tainted in any way, or you're pouring clean water into a tainted vessel, what happens to it? Isn't the whole thing colored? Shouldn't the vessel be clean when you pour clean water into it or milk or anything else? The vessel is your mind. When you stand praying or meditating or contemplating, forgive yourself for harboring any kind of negative thoughts and forgive everybody on the face of the earth. Your vessel, your mind must be clean. Therefore, if you have aught against any person, Surrender that person to the God presence, wishing for that person health, happiness, and peace and all the blessings of life. You must do that to the point where you can meet the person in your mind and you rejoice at hearing good news about him or her. It's a benediction that goes forth from you. You no longer sizzle. If you sizzle, or you're down on yourself, or you're angry with someone, you certainly can't meditate or contemplate in the eternal verities. Because if the pipe is dirty, full of corrosion and rust, you know, the water 
wants to come through. But isn't the water muddied? Yes, of course it is, because it comes through an unclean pipe. When you stand praying, therefore, forgive if you walk against any. A con uh, what we call a meditation is really the practice of the presence of God, as Brother Lawrence called it many years ago. And he said, whenever my attention wanders away, in fear or doubt or resentment, I bring it back to the contemplation of his holy presence. Yes, uh, meditation in its most effective form is the practice of the presence of God. Seeing God everywhere, in every person, tongues in trees, sermons in stone, songs in running brooks, and God in everything. <clears throat> Don't say that you can meditate. Of course you can. You're always meditating, as I said. Don't say, oh, I have to take some lessons in meditation. <clears throat> I'm not spiritual enough. I must take some special training. All of that is nonsense, because you're always meditating. Everyone can and does meditate. For example, a man gets up in the morning, and he looks at the uh, stock market, he sees what happened, and he's mad because he lost money, he's mad at the broker, he's mad at himself, he's mad at the organization. He wants to write a letter to them, telling them they're not running their business properly. And he gets all excited. He fusses and fumes and is all agitated. He has a first-class meditation, but it's very negative. Some people meditate on the races. They went to the races, and they lost a lot of money, and they're beginning to dwell upon it. Why did they pick the right horse? How much money they lost? And they're mad at the jockey and so on. That's a first-class meditation with extremely negative results. Oh, yes, they criticize the uh, the owner of the horse, and they criticize the jockey, and they criticize themselves. And they want to uh, transform the world, you know. Yes, everyone meditates. But you can also meditate on the fact, as you're driving along the road, that God is guiding you now. The right action reigns supreme. The divine love fills your soul. Divine peace floods your mind. And the divine love goes before you today and every day, making straight, perfect, and joyous your way. So the man who meditates on the horse races or the stocks, yes, he thinks about the subject. Everything else fades away, his family, his business, his home life, and everything else. He's all absorbed and his losses in the stock market or the horse races. But you can also meditate on something spiritual, something wonderful, like the 91st Psalm, or the 23rd Psalm. The psalmist says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the first psalm. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's the 19th psalm. Psalms are songs of God. Magnificent way to meditate. To meditate is to absorb, digest, ingest these great truths. It means to incorporate them in your soul. Like an apple, as you eat it, becomes a part of your bloodstream. Likewise, the truths of God must become a living part of you. And when they are, you're compelled to express these great truths which you have meditated on. The Bible is replete with references to meditation. To meditate in the language of the dictionary means to keep the mind or attention fixed upon. To muse upon or over. To consider something to be done or effective. To engage in thought or contemplation, to ruminate, reflect, cogitate, study, think about. Actually, no one can teach you meditation because you're always meditating. No one can eat an apple for you. No one can taste salt for you. You have to taste it and say, now I know what he's talking about. This is why the Bible says, taste the Lord, for he is good. Meaning, you have to ingest, digest, and absorb these truths. Become engrossed in them, so they're a living part of you. Then you become kindly, noble, godlike, gracious, and full of goodwill. 
As the psalmist points out, your delight is in the law of the Lord. And the law is you are what you contemplate, you are what you think all day long. Give your attention and devotion to the great truth. As he think it in his heart or subconscious mind, so is he. So does he act, so does he become, so does he experience. There is no other law under the sun. That's the whole law. That's from Proverbs 23rd. It is the ideas, beliefs, and opinions impressed in your subconscious mind that are projected and made manifest on the screen of space. You must incorporate the eternal truths of God in your subjective depths before they will become operative in your life. You must bring forth, show forth, dramatize, and experience the results of your meditation. You must therefore practice meditation on eternal verities and follow the injunction of the psalmist when he says, Let the words, the thoughts expressed of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart, the inner silent knowing of the soul, your deep abiding faith and conviction, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and Redeemer. In other words, are your thoughts and ideas, your feelings and your beliefs, are they in line with the universal truths of God, the things which never change, the same yesterday, today and forever? In other words, your brain and your heart must agree in what you affirm. To state it still another way, your conscious and subconscious must agree. Then comes the manifestation of your good. Your thought and feeling fused together represent the union of the male and female elements within you, which are divine agencies resulting in the joy of the answered prayer. True meditation is the way of experiencing the presence of God. It is the quickest method of becoming illumined, inspired, and absorbed in a moment that lasts forever. This means that you become engrossed in the Divine Presence, the Living Spirit Almighty within you, intensely confirming that the Living Spirit is the only present power, cause, and substance, and that everything you are aware of is a part of the infinite being and manifestation. Sit down quietly and focus your attention on this greatest of all truths, that you are truly meditating, then you are truly meditating. You are mentally digesting, ingesting, and absorbing this truth into your mentality in the same manner as a piece of bread becomes a part of your tissue, muscle, bone, and your bloodstream. Everybody meditates to an extent, either constructively or negatively. For example, John Jones gets up in the morning and immediately picks up the newspaper, reading headlines dealing with politics, crime, international disturbances, and other negative stories. If he, uh, is ups if he is disturbed by these, naturally, he sometimes gets angry. He wants to write a letter to the columnist who wrote the article. He fumes and fusses, gets agitated and perturbed. Why should he write that? And he's mad at what goes on at the welfare, and people driving in, as he says, in Rolls Royces and Cadillacs with food stamps. And he says he burns up when he sees this. Well, that's the first class meditation with very, very negative results. There are many people like this man. They meditate on old hurts, peeves, grudges, grievances, and mistakes they have made. They don't know they're magnifying the trouble. If a negative thought comes into your mind, cremated with the right thought, such as God is love and his peace fills my soul. For example, if you're dwelling on what the prophets of doom and gloom are predicting, or if you're mentally quarreling with the boss on your job, you're indulging in a first-rate meditation which is followed by negative results. Your silent conversation with yourself is always made manifest in your experience. The silent thinking and imaging in your heart comes forth as form, function, experience, and the events of your life. You're meditating spiritually when you think about the infinite being and presence and power and remind yourself that God or the living spirit is boundless love, infinite indulgence, absolute harmony. And this presence and power is omnipotent, 
omnipresent, omniactive, the only present, the only cause, the only substance. Then contemplate what this means to you as the highest form of meditation. Nothing is grander or greater than that. Think quietly about this divine presence from all angles and the wonders that can and will happen to you as you give your allegiance, loyalty, and devotion to the one presence and power, not to men, institutions, creeds, or dogmas, but to the living spirit which created you and all things in the entire world. And everything you see is the manifestation of it. Then you'll begin to see peace where there is discord, love where there is hatred, Joy where there is sadness, and life where there is so-called death, for God is life, and that is your life now. Life was never born, it will never die, water wets it not, fire burns it not, wind blows it not away. Sores pierce it not, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're a spirit now, you will always be a spirit, a billion years from now you'll be alive somewhere. Because you are the living spirit, almighty, walking the earth, assuming the name of John Jones or Mary Jones. We're all garments which God wears as he moves through the illusion of time and space. Begin, as he said, to see sermons in stones, you can. Tongues in trees, songs in running brooks, and God in everything. The results of your meditation will shine forth as peace, joy, gentleness, goodness, faith meekness and temperance, and health and vitality and abundance, too. I knew a murderer in New York, City, who admitted he had killed a man. He had an intense desire, however, to transform himself and to be reborn mentally and spiritually. I wrote down the qualities and attributes of God for him. He began to still the wheels of his mind, and for fifteen or twenty minutes, Several times a day, he would quietly, silently, and lovingly claim and feel that God's love, peace, beauty, glory, and light were flowing through his mind and heart, purifying, cleansing, healing, and restoring his soul. He restoreth my soul. He had an intense desire to become a new man. He wanted to do great things. He, wa he wanted to put his hand to the plow and contribute to humanity. This intense desire, this decision, was 75% of his healing. Just the same as an alcoholic. Wants to give it up, become a new man in God. Then you have no problem. He suffers for the joy that is set before him. The joy of being a new man. The joy of vitality, of peace, of harmony, sobriety, tranquility, serenity and the joy of being able to contribute again to humanity and live a godlike life. As he did this regularly, this murderer, he activated and resurrected the qualities of the infinite resident in his subjective depths. He continued meditating every night and morning. At the end of about a month, while meditating one night, this man's whole mind and body, as well as the room he was in, became a blaze of light. He was actually blinded like Paul by the light for a while. He said to me that all he could remember was that he knew the whole world was within him, that he felt the ecstasy and rapture of divine love permeating every atom of his being. His feeling was indescribable. He was, in other words, in that moment that lasts forever. You're never the same again, you know. He was transformed. He began to teach others how to live, was under a subconscious compulsion to bring forth and express the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. What good is any teaching? What good is meditation? What good is any church? What good is any man? except he becomes a channel through which these eternal melodies of God are played. You are meditating when you take a verse or verses of a psalm and begin to dwell on the inner meaning of a psalm, such as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
This means that you have chosen God or infinite intelligence as your shepherd. And the Lord is your shepherd, and you shall not want. And you will never want for evidence of the fact that you have chosen infinite intelligence as your guide, as your counselor, as your wayshore, as your source of supply. The psalmist tells you exactly what happens when you choose God or the infinite intelligence as your shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. The choice of God as your shepherd shows belief in his guidance and his love, which shepherds all other thoughts, ideas, and opinions, and leads you to ways of pleasantness and to paths of peace. A shepherd watches over his sheep. He loves them. He cares for them. Yes, he protects them also. At night, when they come into the corral, he looks at their nose and at their feet to see if there are any needles or thorns or something there that might hurt them. And he puts oil on. He removes them and puts oil on them. He leads them to the shade because the sheep are dumb animals. They remain under the broiling sun. He goes over the uh, field where they feed, because where they graze, because he wants to see if there's any loco weed because then the sheep would go insane. Loco weed is something like LSD that drives people insane too. So he protects the sheep in every way. He leads them, of course, to water. He calls them by name and they follow him. And he loves them and he cares for them. Then thousands and thousands of sheep are in one corral, but each shepherd, when he calls his sheep, they follow him. They know his voice and they follow him. The shepherd is your dominant conviction of the goodness of God in the land of the living. The dominant idea that master thoughts you have governs all your thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and opinions. So why don't you say today, the Lord is my shepherd, and I sing the song of the jubilant soul. For I'll never want for evidence of the fact that I've chosen that infinite intelligence as my guide, my counselor, my way sure. My troubleshooter, my adjuster, my paymaster, my boss, and my all. You're told exactly what follows. For he leads you to paths of righteousness for his namesake. That means right thought, right feeling, right action, right results. Divine intelligence rules, you can say to yourself, divine intelligence rules and guides me in all my ways. I shall never want for peace or harmony or guidance, because infinite intelligence guides me. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light upon my path. You can sit down under a tree, close your eyes, and meditate on these great truths. Surely, that's real meditation, with marvelous results, because you're dwelling upon, focused upon, engrossed and absorbed in these simple truths. Yes, you will lie down in green pastures, since God is prospering you spiritually, mentally, materially, financially, socially, intellectually, beyond your wildest dreams. You find yourself beside the still waters, as you claim the river of peace, but my mind, my heart, and my whole being. My mind, you say to yourself, is now serene, it's calm. It reflects God's heavenly truths and light. My soul, my deeper mind, is restored, for God's love enters in, and God's peace floods my mind and my heart. And divine love dissolves everything unlike itself. I think of the holy presence within me all day long. I walk the paths of righteousness through my devotion and attempt to God's eternal verity. I know there is no death, and I fear no evil, for God is with me. I know that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. God's rod, love, and staff, truth, thing you lean upon, comfort, sustain, and nourishes me. Thou shalt prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. 
hearts, and of course you know the enemies are in your own mind. Their doubt and fear, anger, resentment, self-condemnation, these are the fears generated by ourselves. They're always in your own mind. They are nowhere else. For the thing you fear does not exist, and it need not exist, except you indulge it, entertain it, emotionalize it. And therefore, you can contemplate the presence of God right where you are. You're in the banquet house of the Lord. You can tune in on the infinite with your own thoughts this very moment. And you can eat of, which means meditate. Eat of, you can absorb. Mentally digest the nourishing truths of God. For God's love surrounds me, his peace fills my soul, the light of God illumines my path. And you then, you're um, preparing a table before you in the presence of the Lord, the Lordly power. There's only one power, the God presence within you. For the Lord, he is God. And God is the living spirit within you, the I am, the Om of India. Eat the nourishing truth, therefore, whenever fear or worry trouble you. The bread you eat is God's idea of peace, love, and faith. Surely that's the bread of heaven. Lord, he said evermore, give us this bread. Because you're dwelling upon the eternal verities which never change, you're eating of these things. Uh, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. The meat I eat is the omnipotence of the infinite, all-powerful, the ever-living one, the all-wise one, the all-knowing one, the self-renewing one. The wine I drink is the essence of joy. The wisdom of God anoints my intellect. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light upon my path. My cup, which is your heart, is truly the chamber of God's presence. It runneth over, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because you have chosen God as your shepherd. You're eating of that fruit. You're masticating it. You're chewing the cud, so to speak. And it becomes a living part of you, like a cow chews clover. And it becomes a part of the cow's milk, doesn't it? so that you can taste it and also smell it. So these truths are transformed and transmuted into harmony, health and peace, inspiration and guidance in your mind and in your heart. And your cup runneth over with love and joy. You mentally dwell on goodness, truth and beauty, for this is the house of God where you now dwell. And Lord, he said evermore, give us this bread, the bread of peace, the bread of harmony, the bread of joy, the bread of love and goodwill. This is the bread of heaven. And you drink that old wine of heaven, which is the wisdom of God, which anoints your intellect as a lamp unto your feet, as a light upon your path. Now, you don't have to establish any particular postures. You don't have to turn towards the east or assume a Buddhistic posture, you don't need flowers, or music, or incense, or anything. Because, you see, when you truly meditate, you need no props. You can meditate on a plane, or on a train. So if you're on a plane, and there's lightning and thunder, and the plane is tossed to and fro, I'm sure you don't know where the east is, or the west, or the north, or the south. I am sure you have no incense either, or any beads. I am sure you don't have any music, or flowers, or anything of that nature. The minute you start from the outside, or you use any props, you're on the wrong track. You always start from the inside. Inside, humidity, which is to practice the presence of God. Because if you have props, they will always betray you. If you're on a train that's derailed or something, I am sure you don't say, where are the flowers? Let's burn the incense. Let's have some music. Let's turn towards the east. Let's cross our legs in a stout Buddhistic posture. Let's turn towards Mecca. I'm sure that's laughable, isn't it? Uh, likewise, when you start on the inside and you meditate on the great truths of God, 
Yes, your blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, it's lower. Your pulse is lower. Every organ is bathed with the light. You're playing on your body, which is molecular, waves of light. The melody of God. The melody of the one who forever is. And every atom of your being, as you start from the inside, dwelling upon God and his love, every atom dances to the rhythm of eternal God. The late David Seabury, Dr. David Seabury, distinguished psychologist, told me a very interesting experience based upon Quinby's techniques. By the way, his father was secretary to Phineas Parkes Quinby, 1847. And as you know, Quinby was the greatest healer America's ever known. He was clairvoyant, and uh, he would read the contents of the mind of the individual, tell him the cause of his sickness. In most instances, it was based upon false religious beliefs. At least over 60% of the people who came to Quinby were sick because of false religious beliefs. And he said that they got their infection in the church because of guilt and fear and things of that nature. The clergymen of that day didn't like Quinby, of course, denounced him, called him a charlatan, a knave, and many other uh, unlovely names. But anyhow, the poor people, he said, loved him. And he had he was this marvelous healer. Now, Seabury's father was a secretary, and Quinby died in his father's arm. And Seabury knew Quinby's techniques. He was the only one in America who really knew Quinby's techniques. He told me about a woman, a very wonderful woman. Uh, she was with her husband one day, and this, her husband was shot in front of her eyes. And she became paralyzed, that is to say, the brain, as Quinn as Seabury said, didn't send the uh, messages to the spinal area. In other words, she was paralyzed mentally, so to speak, in her brain. And she couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair. They did everything possible for her, and nothing could be done. She was paralyzed from the waist down. And also placed in a wheelchair. Thought she would never walk again. Well, now, he used an old, old technique of Quinby. Quinby finally, of course, began to practice what is called the presence of God. He said wisdom healed his patience. He, he had a vivid contemplation of the ideal. In other words, he would contemplate harmony, beauty, love, peace, vitality, wholeness. He see the patient as the patient ought to be. And the, that would be communicated to the patient. And the patient would pick it up. And he was a remarkable, marvelous result. But anyhow, Seabury talked to this woman. And he said, you ride horseback and you swim. You're athletic. He said, now this is what I want you to do. Even though you're in a wheelchair and even though you're paralyzed, imagine you're on a horse. You're feeling the mane of the horse. You're touching the horse, the stirrups, and the whole thing is real. Contemplate the reality of it. Yes, make it vivid, make it real. Actualize it. You're touching the horse and you're feeling it and you're jumping over a fence and all that is real. You don't see yourself on a horse. You are on the horse and you feel the reality of it with all the sensory vividness of your command, just like an actor dramatizes a role. He lives the role, doesn't he? He doesn't see himself on the screen. He doesn't see himself doing something. He is doing it. He feels the reality of it. And he said, now do this several times a day. Also, you're swimming. You feel the chill of the water. The movement, it's all real. Someone is congratulating you and crossing the uh, lake and so on. She kept this up three or four times a day, 15 or 20 minutes, using her imagination, feeling the reality of it. And he said, the day will come when you'll walk. This went on for weeks and went on for months. Then her son was in a foreign country. And the only son, she loved him. This woman suddenly got a high fever. The doctor came, gave her some um, antipyretic uh, tablets or medicine and told her she had to stay in bed because she had a high fever. And then uh, Seabury arranged for her son to call her from, a, I think, to South Africa, as far as I remember. And the nurses were told, pay no attention. They were to be away. 
and she would use the cane to get their attention, you know, they'd come. The telephone was put about twenty feet away also. Then she was told her son would call her at a certain hour. But remember, she had been meditating for a long time. When the phone rang, it kept ringing and ringing, all this was prearranged. She got up out of her bed to answer the call, call of love. She loved her son, and she heard his voice. And Seabury said she walked after that and lived to be ninety years of age. Well, now, she was meditating. It's not the mystery, you know. Don't make a mystery of it. There's practical meditation, transcendental meditation. It's practical, down to earth. She got results. You must show the results of it. Uh, it is uh, common, really, as breathing or eating, you know, or the circulation of your blood. Uh, so there's nothing strange about this. She invested her mind, her thoughts, and that which is constructive. After all, the spirit in her can't be paralyzed. She was paralyzed, really, in her mind. The great fear, the great shock, the tragedy, and all that affected her. So, as uh, Seabury said, actually, it was a paralysis of the brain, for there was no spinal in injury of any kind, the nerves weren't severed, or anything of that nature. It was really a psychological paralysis. But you see the wonderful result, because of the investment of her mind. Uh, they asked um, um, Newton, you know, how he brought forth his marvelous inventions. He said, I intended my mind in a certain direction. All right, what kind of an investment is your mind bringing forth? If you're a broker, are you getting the right ideas for your clients? If you're a doctor, you can invest your time and attention, say every patient I touch will be miraculously healed, everyone I prescribe for. This will be the right medicine. I'm guided to do the right thing. Everyone I operate on, miraculous healing power is operating, for there's only one power anyhow. You are investing your time and you're getting results because you're pouring life and love into the idea. <clears throat> now, as I said before, you don't need any particular postures or anything of that nature. You're always on the false path when you do that, when you start from the outside. As in India they teach, that's the false teaching. You start from the inside, the yoga of love. And then every single atom of your being is transformed. If you're at peace, and if there's tranquility in your mind, you don't have to worry about high blood pressure, do you? Or um, rapid pulse, or anything else, or ulcers. Because there are no ulcers where peace and harmony and joy and love dwell. Uh, transcendental meditation, yes, elevates the person above the confusion, the trial, tribulations of the world. And... Uh, it's fine. They, in India, they teach you. They give you the mantra called Om. And you repeat Om, which is I am in our Bible, third of Exodus. It means being life awareness. And you that's a mantra. And you say Om, 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 meaning I am or God, being life awareness. The living spirit has no name. But you see, uh, it isn't the vocalization of the word. It isn't the articulation. It isn't the sound, it's the meaning behind it. So if you really understand what that means, that is boundless love, infinite intelligence, and absolute harmony, absolute joy, and all-powerful and all-wise, and that's in the back of your head, and you're saying, oh, and then you realize that all these qualities are being made manifest in your life, in your thoughts, your words, your deeds, in all phases of your life. Of course, then, that would be meditation. That would be transcendental meditation, in the true sense of the term. But just say the word, no. You must have the meaning of the word. For example, you can say Coca-Cola to yourself for 15 or 20 minutes. Close your eyes, relax, and say Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. You'll get a very quiet mind. But I don't believe there's much, uh, there much in the way of results from that. Surely you can. No, uh, you can say Om to yourself, or I am. Some of our great poets did. And you can leave your body, you know, that is, you find 
and that you are in the next dimension of life, a great sense of peace and tranquility and serenity. Many of the ancient mystics did it. Nothing wrong about it. You get into that bliss and, and that inner peace. But remember, you're also living in this objective world, and you're here to bring forth peace and harmony. You're here to put your hand to the plow. And the results of your meditation must appear in your body, in your environment, in your home life, your relationship with people, in your chosen profession, in your music, in your art, in your, if you're a doctor, in all phases of your life. Uh, you're in two worlds, you know, objective and subjective world. You can't live in the air all the time. Uh, your ideas, your philosophy has to be made manifest. So wonderful sense of inner peace can fill your soul as you dwell upon the God of peace. You see, you're in a subjective and objective world. Therefore, you must bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Therefore, people say, where are the fruits of the Spirit? Where is your peace, your harmony, your joy, your abundance, security, your illumination, creative ideas? Are they blessing humanity? Are you all wrapped up in another world? No, meditation comes, of course, from the word middle in Latin. You're mediating between the invisible and the visible. You're bringing your ideas, your truths of God, into form and function, into experience and event. For faith without works is dead. And the works are your, the, your business, your home life, all phases of your life. You must show forth and dramatize and portray the results of your meditation. It must appear in your art. So if we see a sort of a Madonna, a beautiful picture, we realize you've been meditating on the indescribable beauty of God. And of course you bring forth beauty. And if you meditate on love, Dr. Fox told a story, the late Dr. Fox, author of Sermon on the Mount, told a story one time, a man who was full of hatred and resentment towards bankers and others. And he told him to go down to Wall Street and stand there for two hours every day, blessing everyone that came out of the broker's office, saying, God's love fills your soul. Every single person, he said, regardless who they are, this you have to do. And the man did it reluctantly in the beginning, but he went down there every day for two hours. He began to do this. And Dr. Fox said the man had a miraculous healing. Why? God's love filled his soul. He was meditating on love. But after a while, he was ingesting it, digesting it, became a part of him. And surely divine love dissolves everything unlike itself. These are the results of meditation. True meditation. <clears throat> yes. Uh, meditary, you know, the, from which the world come, the word comes from, means to intend your mind in a certain direction. To focus your attention on something. Uh, Tesla, the great scientist, and all the great scientists, of course, brought forth their marvelous inventions through meditation. He was asked by a reporter one time how he brought forth all these marvelous inventions, such as the rotary motor and many other inventions too numerous to mention. He said, I do this. He said, I get an idea. I close my eyes. I become still. And I say, infinite intelligence gave me this idea. It's a crude idea, yes, but it fulfills all the parts. It completes the thing in my mind. And every day I go back and I sit quietly and I realize that infinite intelligence fits in all the parts. Every detail is completed in my mind before I give it uh, to the mechanics. There, are, there is no trial and error in my procedure. The whole thing, he said, is completed in my mind, and then I give it to the mechanics. The real thing, he said, is in my mind. The counterfeit is the thing you make. And, of course, that's true of all great inventors. They brought forth these things through meditating and through quietly contemplating the reality of it. So don't make a mystery of meditation. There is no mystery connected with it, because you're always meditating on the great eternal truths of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The uh, murderer is accused of premeditated murder, isn't he? And malice aforethought. Yes, he's 
meditating on it, thinking about quietly and all that, how he can murder someone. He's thinking up of a scheme. He's angry, resentful, and hateful. Yes, it's a wonderful meditation. As he continues to do it, it becomes a subconscious compulsion. Then he gets a gun or whatever he uses and murders the person. So that's why they say premeditated murder and malice aforethought. And the book of Leviticus is said murders of the heart. And the heart is your subconscious mind. And when you murder love and peace and harmony with resentment, hate, jealousy and all these things, aren't you murdering love and peace and vitality, enthusiasm and energy and all the truths of God? Finally, as you continue to do that, it's impregnated. It has impregnated your subconscious mind, and the subconscious is the power that moves the world, and the law of the subconscious compulsion. Therefore, he's compelled to shoot, kill, or whatever it is. And that's, of course, disastrous. Likewise, the man who contemplates love and peace and harmony and joy and inspiration and illumination, as he continues to do that, he's compelled to express these truths. He's compelled to sobriety with an alcoholic and peace of mind. And the murderer that I mentioned, who contemplated the presence of God regularly and systematically, he was compelled to be God's man. He couldn't repeat the mistakes of the old. Of course not, because the law of your deeper mind is compulsion. He went forth to help men, went into jails, began to talk to them, and so forth. And this is true, of course, of the reformed criminal. He can't repeat the mistakes of the old because he's a new man in God, a divine compulsion. He's a soldier of God. So realize the uh, wonderful, wonderful truths that are within you. An actress, for example, uh, she's fearful and worried that she might strike the wrong note. Let's say she's a singer. What does she do? She meditates. And she strikes this note again and again and again. God is the great musician. God is a singer. The whole world is a song of God. For the universe means the one song. God sings the song. That song is man. All manifestation. Everything vibrates in the universe. There's a world of densities, frequencies, and intensities. In the mystic meditation, you can hear the music of the spheres. Of course you can. For everything sings. And she said, God sings, speaks, and acts through me. I sing in majestic cadences, and song come forth. It will thrill the soul of man. I'm poised, serene, and calm, relaxed, and at ease. It's God singing through me. For God made my vocal organs, and there's only one voice, the voice of the one who forever is. And she does this again and again and again, having different sessions, five or ten minutes, three or four times a day. What does she do? That's the alchemy of the mind. She magnifies in meditation the role she wishes to play in actuality, doesn't she? She wants to be poised, serene. She wants to give forth a song that will thrill the soul of man. And she does it again and again and again, in silence of her own soul. What happened? She's compelled to express it. Of course she is. Don't make a mystery of it. There is no mystery, and no one can teach you how to meditate, for, as I said before, no one can eat an apple for you. The discipline of looking inwardly is meditation. You turn towards the one, the beautiful, and the good. What we understand, we do naturally. What we do not understand, we force ourselves to do. Students often tell the teacher how hard they try. The very effort meant failure. For meditation, which is to eat of the truths of God, is always effortless. Tension, exertion, or force result in failure. An excellent way to still the mind is as follows. Imagine yourself on a mountaintop looking into a lake. It's simple, down to earth. You can teach it to your son who's eight years old. In the placid surface you see the sky, the stars, the moon, and those things above the earth. If the surface of the lake is disturbed, the things seen are blurred and indistinct. Thus it is with you. You are not still, not at peace. And the answer to prayer comes only to the man who dwells with all tranquility and the joy of already having received that for which he prayed. Meditation is contemplating the truths of God from the highest standpoint. It is the pilgrimage within. 
realize that half an hour a day spent in meditation upon your ideal, goals, and ambitions will make you a different person. In a few months' time, the gentle, silent acknowledgement comes that God is within you, that the Spirit of the Almighty is now moving in your behalf, and that which you long to be, to possess, to do, is already a fact in your own mind. Realize the great truth that detachment is the key to meditation. That is, we must sever ourselves completely from all worldly and false beliefs and opinions of the world and focus silently upon the truths of the one who forever is. It is the effortless effort which causes us to flow towards that which we realize without conflict. Detachment doesn't mean that we give up what few earthly possessions we may have. It means that we must give up possessiveness in ourselves, or at least the attachment that peculiarly limit us to a human viewpoint in all matters. In other words, you fast from the false beliefs of the world, from the poison of the world, the poisonous concepts of the world. Be still and know. Stillness is not only keeping quiet, it means that the cause within the self, by which the inward life is rendered discordant, have been removed. It indicates there must be no inner dissonance or discord, but rather that when man goes within himself, he must find perfect and abiding peace. Knowing that God or the living spirit is within him makes man live in a world that is ever peaceful, for that's his boss, his guide, his counselor. The lack of it makes him live in a series of conditions which grieve him to the end. He fusses about things which, if he saw them differently, would not cause one moment of unhappiness. You can meditate on t Times Square in New York or on Hollywood Boulevard. You don't need to go into an ashram or a mountain retreat for God indwells you. And you can commune with God this very moment, under the tree, in the silence of your own home, or wherever you may be, in an airplane, in another train, or even driving to work. You can still meditate. There's no mystery. There's no trick. And you don't have to pay a thousand dollars. To learn how to meditate, for no one can teach you how to meditate. Every day of our life we should meditate on beauty, love, and peace. We should feel these qualities are being resurrected within us. As we meditate daily on this inner beauty, realize the, the love, the light, and the glory of the infant are moving within us. As you meditate on Om sometimes, or the I Am, like Tennyson and others, dwelling on what it really means, like the ancient mystics did, <clears throat> you find, as you meditate on Om again and again, you find the life force leaving you through the back of your head. And this thing called the body becomes somewhat unreal, becomes waves of light, really. And this earth upon which you are seated becomes unreal. The external life becomes a dream. The internal life awakens and moves further and further inward. Finally, you merge. You touch the infinite being within yourself. And you perceive that by going inward, you have found the universe. All this is based upon effortless effort. The minute you use any effort, no results. You discover that the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets are within you. For the first time, you know that planets are thoughts, that suns and moons are thoughts. And your own consciousness is the realization which sustains them all. The temporally in space are moving the dreams of the dreamer. And the sun, the moon, the stars are thoughts of the thinker. God or spirit is meditating on the mysteries of himself. The in, this inward journey ultimately leads man to the real. It leads man away from the sense of the small eye to the realization of the eternal self the one alone who lives in the hearts of all men, for we are all spirits. You are a spirit now, when, you, when will you cease to become a spirit? You are always a spirit, for a spirit is the living spirit within you, the God present. And you are conditioning it by calling yourself John Jones or Mary Jones. The mystic's mind through meditation finds the peace, the strength, and fortitude for further steps. The practice of the disciplines of meditation, which is the practice of the presence of God, Presence of harmony, beauty, love, peace, joy, right action, wisdom, and understanding. This bestows beauty, love, 
peace, grace, and dignity upon every impulse, every attitude, and every act. Every day of our lives, we should begin to meditate upon the beauty, the glory, and the profundity of the Eternal One, dwelling in the changeless One within ourselves. We find an ever-abiding peace which stretches out beyond the stars, beyond time, beyond space. When we are imbued with lofty ideals, when we think universal thoughts, Little things disappear, and all the petty things of life become inconsequential and are forgotten. Our soul actually becomes filled with the glory of the whole, and the limitations and restrictions of our daily life vanish. We find that this happy mood lifts us up and brings us in rapport with the universal mind of the infinite as greed, jealousy, discord, and other narrowing concepts which bind us to the wheel of pain disappear from our mind, forgotten in the joy of truth. We then become a citizen of free consciousness. We become one with the universal vistas. The whole world is our country, and to do good our religion. Constant meditation, either in the woods, in your own home, or wherever you may be, cause your mind to thrill as though touched by a divine harmony. And a pulsating, throbbing feeling pervades every part of it. Many experiencing as it, experience it as a tingling sensation in the spinal area, as if the melody of God were played on your sacral plexus. It's a wonderful feeling, yes. You can do that wherever you are. Meditate on the one who forever is deep in your own soul. For you can dwell in the secret place. The secret place is your own mind where you walk and talk with God. No one knows what you're thinking about this morning. And maybe as you're washing the dishes or your eyes are closed and you're meditating on some great truth. You can meditate on love. The love of a boy for his sister, he says, like committed the crime, and he wants to go to jail for his sister. The love of a boy for his dog, of course he loves the dog. The love of a mother who takes her crippled son all over the world to all the spas and all the healing shrines, that he might get a healing. The love of a father who works overtime, who tries everything possible to get a healing for his son. And then there is the love of the sailor or the soldier. And he says to himself, I'm single. These other boys are married. They have children. He gives his life for them. And uh, you can contemplate the love of music, of course, the love of art and the love of life and the love for the great eternal truths of God. You can contemplate it for half an hour or an hour. But all the love that you can con contemplate and think of is the faint, faint adumbration of that infinite ocean of love, for God is love. So imagine, if you sat down and used this mantra, it's the greatest of all mantras. Yes, you can say, I am to yourself, our own, but be sure you know what it means, and what it means to you. But the greatest mantra of all, apart from saying, I am our own, the word, themse the word itself, means nothing. It's what it means to you. It's your feeling about the truth of that word. If it's boundless love, an infinite intelligence, absolute harmony that permeates every atom of your being, your mind, be inspired from on high, fine. But you can say, God is love, and his love fills my soul. That's a magnificent mantra. Nothing is greater than that, really. Because love dissolves everything alike itself, for God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And love is the universal solvent. It has neither height nor depth, neither length nor breadth, neither comes nor goes. It fills all space. The ancients called it love. So God's love, God is love, that love fills my soul. It dissolves everything unlike itself. And that's the most wonderful mantra in all the world. 
It's a free, it's available to all. You can use it. You can ingest, digest it. God is, and all there is is God, in all, over all, through all, and all in all. And his love fills your soul. His light illumines your pathway, for God is love.